Croix to a channel blight fluid. Such a restful intro. Yes, it's time to go far beyond the world again. And just before we get started, I have a couple of people to mention. One is Mo, who you may know also did some music for Kemia. He's doing some tracks for Far Beyond the World as well. So I'll put a link to his YouTube channel in the description so you can listen to the Far Beyond the World music without me talking over it all the time. And a special mention goes out today to Grizz, Popot, David Taylor, Evan King, The Beholder and Sumuto, who are my top patrons. So thanks guys for supporting the channel. And if anyone else is interested, I'll put the link in the description as well. But enough of me chatting and shouting out to people. I know why you're here. Let's get back to where we left it last time. I'm stirred from my blissful nothingness, forced back into the waking world. A world which I tried to escape so desperately over the course of this night. I can still feel his lips linger on mine. I want to sleep, to stay here, unconscious and unaware. But above all, I don't want to feel the confusion and hurt left by that kiss. Yet something persists, reaching out to me through the veil. I hear a faint call. It almost sounds like a hummed song woven together from many voices. Wake up! I want to ignore it, but its melody promises me comfort I've been craving all those torturous hours, and I finally give in. I open my eyes, looking drowsily around. It's still dead of the night, yet the bedroom is bathed in the white glow. I could almost mistake it for a day, had it not been for the ambient blue tint. There's no tightness in my chest, which forces me fully awake. The air is humid, almost choking. It's hard to breathe, and my gasps rattle me further. I have to step outside, even if just for a moment. I simply need to catch some fresh air, for another panic attack sets in. I hop off the bed and approach the door slowly, mulling carefully over my decision to leave while I do so. I don't want to wake up the wolf, but I also cannot stay inside. My skin feels on fire, as if the air itself burned me. I grab onto the handle, trying to turn it without making much noise. The bolt clangs softly as I unlock the doors. I try to open them as quietly as possible, but the hinges screech in prolonged agony. There's no other way around it, so I pull the doors ajar as fast as I can. Once I peek into the main room, I can see Rannoch sleeping on the floor, next to the now-cold hearth. I feel bad for occupying his bed, but it was his choice to sleep here. Normally I'd rather trade places with my host, but I'm still not over how we left things off. Though I can understand he's in a conflict, it wasn't fair of him to just leave me like that. I see him move, and for a moment I think the wailing hinges have woken the male, but he only assumes a more comfortable position on his pile of blankets. When I realise he's still asleep, I sigh in relief and begin moving towards the outer doors. However, as I pass next to him, the floor creaks and I stop dead in my tracks. I throw a cautious gaze at the wolf, only to notice his troubled expression. He strains his eyes shut, body slightly twitching, while his tail gives frustrated flickers. Although he's quiet, his laboured breath leaves no doubt that he's having a bad dream. Serves him right! For a split second I throw my head towards the doors, thinking it's a fair punishment for what he'd done. But then I realise, I'm not that petty. This isn't me. Although some parts of my mind already succumbed to anger, I managed to wrestle back control. I look to him with pity, quietly kneeling next to his form. I place my hand onto his forehead, gently petting him. I know he didn't mean to hurt me. I've learned by now that the wolf is himself aching, and every of his actions is meant to spare me as much pain as possible. I'm not going to add to our troubles through some petty resentment. As I ruffle his fur, his breath slows down, as the expression softens, wherever tormented him banished by my touch. 
Once he settled into a more comfortable dream, I cannot help but smile. Let at least one of us have a peaceful night. I take a deep breath and stand up, continuing towards the exit. I open the door slightly, peeking through the crack to see if anyone's outside. There's no one around. Cannot even see the sentries where Ronak said they usually camp. After such a party, I bet everyone is simply fast asleep. Or perhaps the location the guards rotates on a night-to-night basis. Whatever the reason, it's quite fortuitous. Relieved, I step outside. The night is warm, with spring winds bringing more of the much-welcome southern air. I walk slowly towards the chair, content on simply staying out on the porch. I sit myself comfortably, almost like a lord on the throne overlooking his serene domain. Despite the cold wood tickling my naked skin, I don't complain. It's a nice sensation compared to the scalding heat which interrupted my peaceful sleep. A stray bead of sweat trails my face, a reminder of that odd feeling. I wipe it off, admiring the scenery. I can't get over how bright everything is, with the waning moon glowing in its full glory. I don't know why, but I feel like taking a short walk, invited by the white light. With a scoff I get up and approach the steps, jumping over the uneven stone. Fool me once, I mutter in amusement, stepping onto the path and trying to decide where to go. The village doesn't seem a good idea. Even if I gained some good faith, snooping between the houses in the dead of night would quickly undo all of that. Which only leaves the woods. Normally I wouldn't even entertain such an idea. Yet an uncharacteristic sense of courage fills me tonight, aided by the luminescent glow showering everything around me. Besides, Ronock seemed adamant that the area around the village is quite safe. At first I step off the path cautiously. However, the deeper I get into the woods, the more at ease I feel. For some reason, the forest seems almost welcoming, as if it awaited my arrival. I cannot help but, but admire how dense and lush it is. Surely I've seen woods in my life. They never seemed this... natural, almost undisturbed by the hand of men. But I'm quickly reminded that this is no ordinary forest. I touch the trees as I pass them, noticing some having their names already claimed. It's an odd feeling, knowing that each of them represents a person. Draig, Talin, Cora. Each wolf living their life alongside a name tree. It's almost surreal to think about. My imagination runs wild. I try to picture a ceremony where a wolf claims his tree. How does that even work? I like to think that the entire village is present, as they observe the youth inscribe their name into the bark under the careful eye of the shaman. That must feel quite something. A milestone, for sure. I trail Cora's name with my finger. The etching, although simple, has an undeniable feminine touch to it. Her tree is a young, slender birch. Unlike another carvings, this one is still bleeding sap. I rub it between my fingers. I guess her name has been claimed quite recently. I decide to continue my walk, slowly meandering between different trees and shrubs when I suddenly come to a stop. My eyes open wide, an unexpected, yet in retrospect, an inevitable sight. I cover my lips, overwhelmed by a surprising torrent of sadness washing over me. A tree in front of me, huge and sprawling, has its name crossed out. Beneath the moonstone tied around the trunk signifies that a wolf's journey has come to an end and he's been laid to rest here. He must have stood here for decades, if not centuries, looking down on those who had passed by. And now it looks down upon me. I approach slowly, surprised by my own reverence, stopping mere inches before an ancient rusty sword half grown into the trunk. I can only assume it means I'm face to face with a once mighty warrior. I struggle to decipher the crossed out etchings. Rin? I mutter with slight doubt. However, speaking the name aloud almost feels if I'm breathing life back into the fallen wolf. I look up as a sudden gust of wind rustles the leaves above me and a slight chill creeps down my back. I gaze around in panic, feeling as if I'm no longer alone. But the woods are empty, 
with only the dead keeping vigil over them. I shake my head at how easily I get spooked. Rest well, my friend. I'm sure you've earned it. I exhale, patting the mighty trunk as I walk off. The deeper I venture, the more trees I see with moonstones glistening in the light, waning, waxing, quarter moons, entire generations of wolves resting peacefully over the watchful gaze of their goddess. Although I feel out of place, the welcoming sensation persists, bidding me to follow. I feel ashamed, remorseful even about the comments I've made about these trees. Seeing them now, entire forests standing as testament to the tribe's history and lineage, I understand the significance. It's a living cemetery. I can only imagine how upset I would be if someone desecrated the resting place of my dearly departed. I wish I could take it all back. But the moonlight doesn't waver, almost if absolving me of my foolish transgressions. I simply take a deep breath and decide to clear my mind. I've been a lot of overthinking lately, and how did that turn out? I follow my two feet, allowing them to take me where they will as I just enjoy the night. I'm not sure how long I've been walking through these woods. I don't even know what direction I took, feeling I might have unwittingly turned around a few times. I begin to worry that I am lost. Not really keen on the prospect of Rannoch having to search for me. This could easily be misinterpreted as an attention-seeking stunt. The last thing I need is the wolf thinking I'm hysterical, which I bet he's quite close to doing on account of my near-constant freakouts. Ah, get a grip. I exhale, rubbing my temple in annoyance. I push forward, bid by the moonlight piercing through some thick overgrowth. I struggle to part the bushes when I suddenly arrive at a clearing. It's akin to the meadow I spent an afternoon with Rannoch. This is a different place, with tall grass waving on the wind like a sea of green. The landscape is dotted by white men here, similar to that erected in the centre of the village. In the far corner I can see a structure resembling a henge, a trio of double, tall megaliths capped with horizontal dolmens. The stones are white and shine in the moonlight like polished marble. I can see a shadow of a person kneeling in the middle of that stone circle. I consider retreating, the moonlight quickly reveals the familiar figure. It's Verissa. She's kneeling in front of a shallow pool, arms stretched out to the sky, her pristine coat almost glittering in the white glow. Mother Moon, I need your guidance. Her voice carries softly on the wind. It's uncharacteristically faint and wavering, completely devoid of her usual composed demeanour. She's clearly distressed. I decide to approach her, moving quietly forward as to not interrupt her prayers. Please, speak to me. She asks again, her words pitiful and desperate. I watch her slumped figure as she stays there silent and expectant, as if truly awaiting a response. Eventually a muzzle rises upwards and she gazes at the white sphere again. I'm sitting here, alone in the darkness. She continues to beg. I can swear she's sobbing. I'm blind without your guidance. My heart begins to sing at a sorrowful state. I don't know what to do. Should I even be here? Clearly it's an intimate moment between her and a goddess. I shouldn't intrude. I proceed to back out slowly, eventually facing the woods once more and another quiet sob reaches me. You've been silent ever since that human arrived. She sighs again, shrinking in defeat, and I stop in my tracks. I turn around, feeling bad called out like that, but I also cannot blame her. I've uprooted her life, even if I did so unintentionally. I caused this, whatever crisis of faith she's going through. It is my fault. I better leave. Have you forsaken me? Did I make a mistake? A rattle breath makes my throat clench. Please, speak to me. She pours her heart out in that last plead. But Aluna isn't going to answer, is she? 
Rose's sorrowful tone breaks my heart, and I cannot bear it any longer. I cannot leave her in such a state. That would be cruel. I take a deep breath and step forward, wanting to reveal my presence. The female's ears perked up even before I speak her name. Verissa? When she hears my voice, she quickly tries to compose herself. Oh, Sam! She exclaims while hastily rubbing her eyes, clearly wanting to hide her tears. You shouldn't be out here. You're past the village boundaries. Oh, it's fine, I reply, approaching the she-wolf slowly and casually looking around to give her time to adjust herself. Everyone's fast asleep, and I doubt you're going to hurt me. I mumble, taking in the scenery. The shrine looks absolutely enchanting. Once I hear that she's collected, I take a seat beside her in the grass. I can't avoid looking at a stone pool in front of us. Is this... Yes. She whispers with a nod. I feel eerie gazing at the birthplace of Vul and Rannoch. Goosebumps appear on my skin as I remember how the dark male was still born, and move until his moon brother entered the world beside him. And it all happened right here. What well, places could tell stories? I sigh, looking at Verissa's troubled expression with worry. Is everything all right? She smiles, almost forcing a chuckle into her words. I was just uh, communing with Aluna. Did she respond? Verissa looks up, releasing a defeated sigh. She's as silent as the moon. The first time I can see her without the confident facade. Unlike Rannoch, she chose to be honest with me for once. I decide to return the sentiment. I know you think it's my fault. What? No! The female interrupts almost automatically. I feared you. No point in beating around the bush. She looks at me with worry, then regards the radiant face of a deity. The moon seems much larger than what I think it should be. Oh, it's not like that. I don't regret saving your life. I just worry I made a mistake somewhere along the way. What could you have done differently? I don't know. You saved my life, and you did so without hurting anyone in the process. Surely that's not a mistake. And if you both honestly believe that this whole mess was fated? I pause, trying to contain a chuckle. Then you're doing the best you can with what little guidance you received. She looked at me almost as taken aback by my words and scoffs in amusement. Eloquent. Perhaps Rannoch is right and you are a lost noble. Marissa laughs. But your words do ring true. But her moon is fickle. She changes her face every night, never in the same mood. It's hard to read her sometimes. The female says in a calm voice, always as if convincing herself as much as me. This world is so alien, yet I feel somewhat responsible for sowing fear and doubt in the hearts of those amazing creatures. Even though they're wolves, they're as remarkable and enthralling as any human I could imagine. Or even more so. I can't help but feel bad. I'm sorry for all of this. I never wanted to cause... No. She interrupts me again mid-sentence. It's me who's sorry. My ancestors warned me that my path would be hard. I need to remain strong. I believe that we're on the right track. She looks back at me with a confident smile, despite wet streaks betraying where tears flowed just a few moments ago. And you proved that at the feast. I don't know about that. I think I might have underestimated Tano. She chuckles. Tano is many things, but he's not malicious. At least not for the sake of it. I thought you didn't like him. I don't. That's because he has a habit of poking his nose into other wolves' business. The female rose her eyes in annoyance. He's a creature driven by curiosity, you see. So, a spark in his interest might have been your saving grace. Still, I would keep my distance if I were you. One never really knows where his sniffing will lead him. I fully intend to. Might be easier said than done, especially now when it's clear he's quite taken by you. So is everyone, for that matter. For a tribe screaming bloody murder every time another kin steps into our borders, that's quite a feat. I'm surprised by her words. Indeed, the tribe wolves seemed wary, if not hostile at first, but as time passed, their attitude towards me improved. 
Hmm. I've also noticed Ranok is getting quite attached to you. He thinks I'm his path, well, that's all. I shrug, not trying to delude myself there's something there when there clearly isn't. If you say so. She smiles on as she knew more than I do. Then again, she did grow up with Ranok while I know him but a few days. Just keep in mind this moonstone is a full moon for a reason. And that means? That he's very much like a Luna herself. Fickle. I force a chuckle to which she only smiles. At first glance, yes. But behind that ever-changing mask is someone constant who will always be there for you. You just have to give them time, just like with the moon. Eventually, a lunar always shows up to brighten the sky. Isn't she giving you a silent treatment, though? Just like Ranok's giving me one. Why are you here? She muses with a much more familiar melodic tone, and one was thrown off by the question. Because Ranok found me. I know. She laughs at me. Why are you here now? I woke up. It was a challenging night. I just needed some air. I mumble, trying to actually figure out how I ended up here. Would it be safe to assume you were distressed? How did you know? I can still smell it on you. She closes her eyes and smiles, twitching her nose in short, discreet sniffs. You needed help. And so did I. Turns out Mother Moon was not being silent at all. She was just being busy. She regards me with a knowing gaze. I asked Aluna for comfort, to bolster my resolve. And here you are. And judging by your rapidly relaxing heart rate and scent, you needed someone to talk to. You mean she brought me here? I exhale in amusement. It's a comforting thought at least, if not a bit of a stretch. I look up at the moon and just take in the light. Even though it's no longer full, the shine it gives envelops nearly everything. All of creation this side of the world is bathed in the white glow. The moon's so unbelievably, unbelievably pretty tonight. Yes, uh, she is. The female regards the argent sphere with amusement, almost as if she only just noticed it. She's smiling at us. Whatever reason, that assessment reassures me. She invites me to sit closer to her, extending her paw behind my back. I scooch over and rest my head on her shoulder as she embraces me. Do you know the story of your birth? Hmm. She nods quietly. But it's a story for another time. Okay. I try not to sound disappointed. Some things come to us at just the right time, Sam. Even if we think we want more, sometimes it's not what we need. What do you mean? I ask in confusion. This bit of wisdom came out of nowhere. However, somehow it feels very relevant to Ranok. Wait, could it be possible she still smells him on me? I wince slightly, wondering if I should perhaps pull away. But then again, if she smells Ranok on me, then it's already too late. Best piece of advice I can give you right now is to just wait. What for? Anything. She shrugs. Just allow for things to come into your life as they may, at their very own pace. Life has a tendency of sorting itself out. Yeah, she's right. Haste is the devil's work and all good things come in time. I should stop rushing over complicating everything and just enjoy myself. Just like now. We both look at the moon in silence. We don't exchange words after that point. The words are needed. We're just taking the glorious radiance of the mother moon. I smile as if feeling her blessing touches both. I can see Verissa being at peace as well, which is more than I could have hoped for. I would not want the female to suffer because of me, nor for her faith to waver. Knowing that I somehow managed to keep her resolve was the greatest reward in itself. I thank Aluna for this gift, whether she's real or not. She definitely turned a bad day around for both of us. I began slowly dozing off on her shoulder, causing the female to exhale to stir me up. Well, that was refreshing. 
Shall we head back? She gets up and extends her paw towards me. I just nod, taking hold of her and standing to my feet. She walks off, but before I follow, I throw a last curious glance towards the pool. I think this is the source of all their moonstones. I'm almost tempted to come closer and take a peek, as if hoping I would find one of my very own. Sam! Something shimmers in the depths of the pool. The waters muddle the image hidden just beneath the surface. My feet tremble slightly as I feel a sudden pull towards the well. My hand itches to reach out to retrieve what I believe is a newly formed moonstone. I look back to Varissa, wondering if she also sees it. The female's already put some distance between us. I gaze back to the waters. Something's definitely there. I want to approach, but I feel the moon's glow intensify, almost as if I stood in the glare of a spotlight. A familiar melody fills my ears as dozens of whispers collide into one simple warning. Don't! The glare retracts and I blink my eyes to adjust my vision. Again I look to Verissa, but she pays me no mind. Whatever's happening is happening only to me. I'm torn, struggling to fight the urge to simply confront the waters. What if there's an answer lying at the bottom of the pool? My mind begins to wander and I find my feet shift slightly towards the water's edge. But I remain still, using all my willpower to defy this pervasive thought. Do not fight it! Sam, what's the matter? I snap out of my stupor, gazing down at the wavy reflection of the moon. I... The waters are dull and empty. Whatever tugged at my inner desire, gone as if it was never there. Another mirage meant to mess with me. It's nothing. I was just admiring the scenery. I mutter, trying to recollect my thoughts. I feel utterly confused. Seems I cannot get away from the voices. But under so much pressure that my anxiety begins to spill into the waking world. For a moment I think of talking to Verissa, but considering our earlier conversation, I don't want to come across if I'm mocking her beliefs. She seems to be already struggling on my account. This is an unnecessary distraction. I guess the whole Aluna talk just got into my head. The female notices my tardiness and approaches me to slip a paw around my elbow and lock arms. Come, it's getting late. If Rannock finds you missing, he will be freaking out. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. She tugs at me slightly and I oblige. I nearly forgot about Rannock on our mishap. I do dearly hope he's still fast asleep. As we return to the village, Verissa guides me back towards the cottage. Apparently I took quite a detour through the woods. It is a wonder how I stumbled upon the moon shrine. Once the house is in our sight, the female bids me a good night. Her home is in the other direction. I wave her goodbye and make my way towards the cabin, an uneasy smile stretching across my face. We both needed reassurance and both have received it. I must allow Rannoch to process things at his own pace. Pressing him isn't fair and will only push us further apart. So far he's been good at opening up when the time was right. Besides, I have other things to worry about. The voices became quite conspicuous now. I hear them. It's not just in my head. Whether I'm going mad or simply spiralling is yet to be seen. But for the time being, I have my plate full. I nearly yelp out as I hear a strange voice mumbling in the bushes. Oh, tigers must be growing really desperate. They think a human will do the trick. Or perhaps they thought it clever. Hard to decide which. You might have them fooled, but I know you speak wolven. I still hold my chest, steadying my rattled heart while the bunny continues his random monologue as if he wasn't even speaking to me. That's right. I'll be keeping a watchful eye on you, you little... Oh, does he think he is? That makes two of us. I barked him in annoyance, pretty fed up with the impertinence of this guy. What are you doing lurking outside our windows, you fucking creep? What did you say? He looks at me wide-eyed, stumbling back into the bushes. I'm done playing games. 
Cut the crap, I don't have time for this. You think you can threaten me? Rannock, Full and Varissa are all in on this. You rat me out. There won't even be a piece of you left once they're done with you. The rabbit stands there shaking. I can't help but smile my ultimatum worked so well. Yeah, how are you doing this? Doing what? Speaking old Sylvan by the spirits. It's like you were born in my burrow. What? This again. No, I'm not engaging at this point. Look, I don't know what game you're playing, but I'm not in the mood for it. If you won't leave me alone, I will tell others that you're on to me and you speak Wolven. That's punishable by death. This makes my secret your secret. So better keep your mouth shut so we can both stay alive. I sneer in anger. I can see Trist is really shaken. I start thinking he really didn't expect me to understand him. I'm not speaking Wolven. None of the wards are. What? No, this is getting too much for me. I'm so confused that the sudden anger that took hold of me simply dissipated. My breath stabilises and I just take a deep exhale. Whatever. I looked at him with a more empathetic gaze. I didn't mean for you to lose your job, but I don't mean for you to lose your life either. So just stay away from me and stop giving me those funny looks. I rushed past him, bumping into his shoulder and causing the bunny to stumble out of my way. I simply run towards the house. My head is spinning with a torrent of conflicting thoughts and emotions. What sort of crazy ride am I on? When I enter the cabin, I close the doors behind me and slump against them. What the fuck is going on? First Wolverine and now old Sylvan? The chief was supposedly speaking to me in some human dialect as well. But they all blend into one. I cannot distinguish one language from another. They're as native to me as my own thoughts. Just like the whispers. I quickly look around the room for some water as my throat clenches and I'm desperately thirsty. I pour myself a cup and swallow greedily. With each gulp I feel the void inside my stomach grow deeper or my heart rate spins completely out of control. I think I might be losing my damned mind. I gaze at the room in panic as it begins to contort again, the shadows extending and reaching out to me. No, no! My eyes well up and my heart is racing at a hundred miles an hour. Please, no! I drop the cup, for I can hear it clang on the floor, everything turns black. No, not this again! I beg, tears cascading down my cheeks like heavy waterfalls. So close! Suddenly I feel a large hand grand up, grab onto my arm, pulling me deeper into the void. No! Let go of me! I shout out with all the air in my lungs. I force myself free, pulling back and stumbling to the floor. Sam, what are you doing? I can see Rannock standing above me with a shocked expression. His paw stood extended where it held me. What's going on? I look around in utter horror, head into the wall behind me. Everything's back to normal, as if nothing ever happened. What? We are just standing there, mumbling. No. Oh, God, no. I'm starting to lose sense of what's real and what isn't. The wolf squats beside me, looking rather worried. No doubt he senses my erratic heart rate. So much for not coming across as hysterical. I'm sorry, didn't mean to wake you up. I mutter, struggling to get up. He aids me with his paw, pulling me back to my feet. I must have been sleepwalking. I'll, I'll go back to bed. I try to rush towards the bedroom doors, but Rannock grabs my hand, gently stopping me in my tracks. Well, I can sense you're in distress. His voice is soft and full of concern. 
Only now I notice I'm slightly shivering and my heart must seem to him as it tried to burst out of my chest. It almost feels as if I have a pocket of air stuck inside. Look, oh, I'm sorry about the kiss. It's always about him. It's not the goddamn kiss. I snap yank in my hand free. Sam! I seriously can't deal with his sexuality issues right now. I run towards the bedroom doors and slam them shut behind me. Since there's no lock, I sit down with my back against them, preventing the wolf from entering without having to force his way in. I try to calm myself, to rein in my rattled breath, but again I'm slowly spiralling. I hear him knock on the door and I sigh in annoyance, struggling to hold back the tears. Go away. I plead sorrowfully. I really don't know what to do. Between the torrent of thoughts in my head and the mixed feelings he invokes in me, I feel like I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place. Sam, what really happened? He asks through the door, and his saddened voice almost makes me want to let him in. If it's not the kiss, why are you so freaked out? I need to know. Your fucking rabbit threatened me. I gasp, finally allowing tears to fall freely. Oh, I threatened him. I'm not sure which anymore. I muttered defeated. I did not handle Trist well. What and when? Although I really want to tell him about my near-constant freakouts and my now apparent weird multilingual abilities, I don't think it's the right time for either. We've just opened one can of worms with that stupid kiss. No point in opening another without putting the lid back on the first. It... It doesn't matter. It would seem I'll have to bite the bullet and take the embarrassment of coming across as too emotional rather than put my mental psychosis on full display. Was it at the feast? I decide to evade with a half-truth. He, uh, he kept giving me funny looks. Well, if that's the case, I'll set him straight. He has no business harassing you. No, don't. I don't want to cause... I cut off, realise now just hours before we both accused one another of making a spectacle of ourselves. A scene? He guesses through a forced chuckle. Oh, a bit too late for that, don't you think? Yeah. We stay like this in silence when I feel his heavy form slump down and press against the door. He sat himself on the other side, mirroring me. I never wanted to make you angry. But I understand why you don't want me there. First I take it too far with the teasing. And then... He holds his breath, unable to even verbalise it. You must be so disgusted. I'm flattered, not disgusted. Huh? He exhales, clearly surprised by my candidness. I mean... Having a wolf like you kiss someone like me? Well, that's any guy's dream, gi given their... Defective? He says in a worried tone and I sigh in defeat. You're not defective, Rannoch. Well, not to me. Maybe, but to everyone else. Fuck everyone else. I snap, annoyed he allows himself to be boxed up like this without putting up even a shred of a fight. What matters is what you think and feel. Do you see me as defective? As someone who needs to be fixed? No. The wolf stutters in panic. You are perfect the way you are. No, I'm the one taken aback by his frankness. A small blush creeping onto my face over the compliment. But at least now I can turn his own heartfelt words against his conditioning. Then for the love of God, stop using that word. I demand sternly. It's even more painful when you use it to describe yourself. You have so much going on, the last thing you need is self-loathing. He falls silent, clearly thinking over what I said. I give him a moment, but eventually sighs deeply. Oh, it's not that simple. Why? Because I'm really not like that, Sam. I do like females. I won't suggest he might be by, but he continues completely throwing off my train of thought. Oh, I'm just an idiot. I know I can be playful, but oh, I took it a bit too far. 
Uh, I just wanted to distract you. You were so distressed and... Well, I'd much rather had you flustered than in tears. So you just kissed me. I almost can't believe his words. Like, how is that even a solution? Oh, my friend is upset. I know he might be into me. Let me give him a pity kiss. I mock his logic. It wasn't like that. He subdues a growl. But... The wolf sighs, struggling with word in his own thoughts. Oh, we both had too much to drink. So you never meant it. No, no, uh, that's not what I'm saying. Again, he protests fervently. What are you saying then? It was a spur of the moment. I had no idea what I was doing until I actually did it. He gives his rash explanation. I can clearly feel his rattle breath rocking the door back and forth. He's really distressed, and I sighed to allow him some time to recollect his thoughts, listen to his strained huffs. I don't know. The wolf sighs in defeat. Uh, oh, I'm so confused. You're a guy, and although I had feelings for a male before, I thought it was just a one-off. But even worse, you're a human. That's got to be messed up, no? As much as the revelation of his early infatuation surprises me, his crude assessment of our situation brings me back to Earth. He isn't wrong. Even I question my attraction to him at times. This is a whole new level of what the hell am I even thinking kind of thing. Yeah, I get how you feel. I nod half-heartedly. Each time I reminded that you're a wolf, a part of me is screaming, What the fuck? I chuckle nervously. Right? He responds in a similar feigned amusement. Oh, I think it's your speech that does it to me. There's no language, Baron. You sound like one of our own. Worse yet, talking to you is easier than to any other wolf I've ever met, because you're an outsider. I don't have to worry about our customs or preconceptions. You just read me like an open book without any judgment. I feel I can be myself around you. That you enjoy me for who I actually am. Not for who you want me to be. I've never felt like that before. I listen carefully as he tries to explain his feelings. Seems I was right. He was forced into a role his entire life. With the watchful eyes dead set on him. One wrong move, one misplaced step, and you're booed off the stage. Failure. Oh, poor wolf. I wipe away a tear, first that I have shed in this world for someone else. You're also the first decision I've made that I can stand by is truly my own. The fact I also saved your life makes me feel responsible and incredibly possessive. Sometimes it feels as if I imprinted on you in those woods. Exhales in resignation, I raise my brow. Imprinted? Oh, it doesn't matter. He mutters dismissively. Just know that to us wolves, being territorial about certain individuals is very much natural. And combined with everything else, it can easily seem like you're in love. Oh, it's messy with my head. Yeah, I could see why. I sigh in understanding. I can definitely relate to his confusion and reservations. My memory loss and loneliness is triggering all of my need for intimacy with you. Not to mention you're the first and only friendly person I can remember. It makes me a little bit clingy. And then being forced into this proximity, with things getting as intense as they did at times. No wonder our emotions are all over the place. I can hear his amused scoff through the door. See? Even now you understand me. It's hard to keep level-headed around you. Right back at you. I laugh softly. But even it is kind of rushed and weird. I really do enjoy our connection. The thing is, I'm enjoying it as well. Maybe too much and is appropriate. He says with a serious tone. I want to reassure him. I don't mind being close. Well, I cannot lose you, Sam. 
His voice cuts me off, his voice cracking until as he strains against his own emotions. He almost sounds desperate. Especially not now, when you're the closest thing to a true friend I have. What about Vol and Marissa? Well, don't get me wrong. I love them, I do. But I still have to put up a mask in front of them. I cannot show any weakness or blemishes. You're the only one who allows me to be the real me. Not only talking about my deep... He cuts off and I smile, because he respected my earlier request. What about my quirk? Yeah, boy. Why would you think you could lose me? Because I already did lose someone once, by allowing things to go too fast. We just met, but I can see something special in you. Well, a friendship worth a thousand shortly flings. Yeah, I think I understand what you mean. And just like that, he's proven once again he's been more considerate than I ever have. I don't deserve this guy. Silence overtakes us as neither know what to say. I suspect he's simply trying to plaster over another crack he allowed to form his facade. I remind myself I need to give him time. He's made good on coming forward at just the right moments. So I wait, ten, maybe twenty minutes, just admiring the white moon slowly setting over the now darkening sky. The night is at its thickest, which means dawn is not too far. I begin slowly dozing off, just listening to his rhythmic breathing on the other side of the doors. But then, a question stirs me up, like a cold water slush into my face. I might be making a fool out of myself. But I have to know. My skin even burns as would be natural in such a scenario. Do you have feelings for me? I hold my breath, almost certain my heart skipped a beat. I wasn't ready for this, and so wasn't my answer. I don't know. I might... I shrug, looking at the window in defeat. Sleeve did not expect my honesty. Really? I sigh. Everything's so muddled, Rannoch. My thoughts race at such speeds that my mind cannot keep up. I idly poke my forehead. It's like a whirlpool of emotions up here. But I do feel something towards you. I can hear he struggles to contain his smile, his voice betraying a hopeful gleam. Something? I want to say love. I'm not that naive. We barely just met and as we both just agreed. Our situation doesn't exactly make things clear. Yeah. I won't lie to you. There's a certain undeniable attraction there. Hmm. He burrows deep in thought, causing my anxiety to spike. I might have been too honest. Well, don't worry. It's not another rejection. He mutters, again picking up on my heartbeat, even from the adjacent room, and drawing a reluctant laugh from me. Damn, his beastly ability is quite enticing at times, though presently my train of thought is a tad inappropriate. I also feel conflicting emotions regarding you. At first I thought I was just excited about my destiny finally unfolding. The more I got to know you, the more I enjoyed your company. I started brushing off to my loneliness. But now, I don't know what's going on. He sighs heavily, taking another moment to collect his thoughts. This is completely new to me. I never connected with anyone like that. Not even with wolves I pursued or grew up with. You are really dear to me. He insists, and the tone of his voice leaves no doubt about it. Well, that's why I cannot risk fucking it up by misreading the situation. I laugh, completely embarrassed by how stupid I am. I keep measuring him with my own yardstick. What's so funny? I thought you were acting immature by bolting after the kiss. And yet again, you proved that between the two of us, I'm the one who's still a kid. Well, that's what I love about you. He chuckles back, but I'm just stunned that you used that word. Hmm? I inquire hesitantly. Oh, cherish your childish naivety. You are clearly lucky enough to retain it. 
why people weeded out very early on. Well, you still put up a fight. He scoffs in amusement. Oh, I try. I take a deep breath and slowly get up to my feet. I place my hand on the handle and turn it, unlocking the doors with a soft clang. As I pull the wing away, I see the wolf's back as he's seated on the floor in front of me. He reluctantly turns his head, meeting my gaze with a weary expression. I extend my hand towards him, trying to give him courage to get up. At first he's reluctant, then he smiles awkwardly. He grabs my hand, but stands up on his own accord, just holding on to me for the sentiment's sake. Once he's up, he looks at me with concern. Hug? I open my arms awkwardly, inviting him to embrace me. Immediately, I hear his tail swing as he nods with a barely contained smile. And just like that, the large furry form envelops me, and I'm surrounded by the scent of the forest. Feels as if I'm rolling in the meadow again, his fur brushing against me akin to the grass. He holds me tight, secure his embrace for a good few moments. I don't mind. I simply surrender myself completely, melting into his form. I needed this, to feel safe and wanted. I just take in his warmth, really relieved that despite everything that happened tonight, our relationship wasn't damaged. In fact, despite our combined mishaps, I very much believe it was strengthened. He continues to keep me close, as if desperate to feel every inch of me pressed against his body. As if fear and I might disappear into the morning mist. My heart stumbles and I feel butterflies fill my stomach. He senses that slight shift and squeezes harder. He grabs my face gently with his paws, warm beans pressing against my cheeks and slightly pushes away. His nose ventures close to my forehead, trailing my skin with its cold, wet tip. I stifle a giggle as it tickles. Then my eyes open wide as he reaches my cheek. There he plants a tender lick, his tongue barely grazing the surface of my skin. We lock our gazes and he immediately pulls me back into his chest. Again, we stay like this for a while, until eventually he lets go of me. Well, I think we both need some time to figure things out at our own pace and on our own terms. He mutters with a saddened voice, yet his expression remains quite determined. What do you mean? I respond in slight confusion. Well, I have no doubt our feelings will clarify if we give ourselves some space. There was something I was meant to do, a scouting mission that would most likely take me away for a few days. What? I feel my heart sink. I did not expect this turn after such a tender moment. Well, I put it off on your account, and Father decided to simply delegate this task to Tano at a later date. Well, aside from me not trusting his tracking abilities, this is urgent. As usual, Rannock picks up on my distress and takes firm hold of my shoulders. Two of our packs are missing, and I was willing to brush them off for the sake of our little retreat from reality. But it wasn't fair. Not towards you, not towards me, and especially not towards the tribe. He looks into my eyes. Though it's hard to argue with the reasoning, its maturity is commendable even. I cannot help but feel betrayed. I know I said I wouldn't leave you, but... If I'm to be chief one day, a good chief, I need to act like one. He insists, his ears falling flat, and I can see he wants this to be our joint decision. How petty would I have to be to inject myself into his line of duty? And despite how easily lulled I am in this weird need for intimacy, I agreed that some time apart could help us get clarity. Half the time, I don't know what to feel anymore. No, I understand. Again, if it's that important. I mutter, but my voice must have been terribly inconvincing as the wolf sighs and pulls me in closer. If I am to protect you, well, I cannot give them any reasons to undermine me. But most importantly, I cannot allow myself to unwittingly hurt you in the process as well. well I think a few days apart will allow our emotions to cool down and settle. Then we'll have a clearer view of what's actually going on between us. He smiles, planting another, this time more encouraging, lick on my cheek, 
putting on my skin teasingly in the process. I chuckle it off, pushing his muzzle away. I'm not going to lie, being left here alone does scare me a bit, but I also know you're right. I nod. You won't be alone. I'll ask Vol and Verissa to take care of you. That actually sounds fun. I mutter half-heartedly. You're a terrible liar. I know, but I really am keen on spending more time with them. It's just going to be strange to find myself without you. Indeed, he's the only constant I've known since I woke up. More the reason to rip off that bandage, huh? Yeah. I chuckle, this time with genuine amusement. I cannot always expect him to be at my side, or with a week and early gone by, it's about time I started acting more independently. Good. He sighs in relief, finally content that my mood is stabilised. Well, I'll go and see my father at dawn. I'll also get Vol and Verissa here. We can have breakfast together. He proposes to a smile. You would like that, wouldn't you? Mmm. I nod with enthusiasm. A joint meal sounds actually fun. Also, it's about time we got you dressed. I didn't forget my promise. He winks, walking towards the bed, and I smile. Consider it to a fault. I guess it only proves I should trust him more when it comes to my own well-being. He'd never want to harm me. I'm more certain about that than ever before. He pulls on the blankets and pats the bed. Well, night is nearly gone, but I still think we should still try and salvage wherever is left for our sleep. I agree and approach the bed, slowly sinking into the linen. I place myself comfortably, but as the wolf tucks me in, my expression turns. You're not coming back to the kitchen, are you? Huh? He seems rather troubled, trailing his gaze between the bed and the doors. Well, I thought that we decided... To take some time apart, yes. But you haven't left yet. I don't want to sound too desperate. My pleading leaves no doubt about my state of mind. If you were to go away, I'd rather spend what little time we have together. He smiles in understanding. You know what? I feel the same way. He mutters as he crawls onto the bed. I blush as he clambers over me, his chest directly over my face. I feel flush, and it's hard not to pull him closer. He simply rolls playfully over the other side. We lock our awkward gazes for a moment until he mimics my earlier gesture and spreads out his arms. Hug? I thought you wouldn't ask. I chuckle, snuggling deep into his chest. This is the last night together of some to come. I'd rather spend it deep inside his fluff. He laughs off my eagerness and embraces me softly as I listen to his thumping tail. Friends or lovers, I have no idea which, nor do I care at this point. I just enjoy being held by someone I feel I can completely trust, who trusts me in turn. Feeling his warmth once again is all I could have wished for after tonight's fiasco. His gentle breath helps me calm my emotions even further until I return to that sweet, sweet, blissful nothingness. I open my tired eyes to see the sun already out in full swing. After my nightly escapade, getting up is a bit of a challenge, but feeling that the wolf is next to me causes my heart to race. I jump out of the bed in panic, feeling he's left without saying goodbye. So I rush into the kitchen I met with the sight of the wolf setting up the table for four. He even brought the chair from the porch to complete the set. Again, as, as it is his custom by now, he won't have any extra duties to attend to. He allows me to rest while he takes care of the morning prep. I sigh through his smile, looking at him with feigned annoyance. He should have woken me up. Well, you are a terrible liar. He scoffs. Well, I know you're out of the house. Did Verissa tell on me? I snicker, pulling up her chair and taking a seat. That too. I can also smell the woods and grass on your skin. Nothing escapes you, huh? Nope. You better get used to that. He winks while I look towards the hearth. He hasn't built the fire yet, and I wonder if he needs some help. Want me to prepare the food? We're not making a fry up today. Too many people for that. Besides, Marissa likes lighter meals in the morning. Oh, what are we having then? I'll ask Walter to bring some cold meats and cheese, with her provided fresh bread. 
He points to a basket with soft rolls. I can smell their yeasty wholemeal aroma even here. That sounds absolutely delightful. I watch as the wolf fills up four tankards one by one. Despite the ale not being my favourite drinks, I am looking forward to unwinding with the three alphas. My, what a company indeed. He sets the mugs in front of the chairs, placing mine next to my hand. I smile and nod in gratitude, really happy to see things go back to normal. Actually, maybe even better than normal, as I breathe the newfound air of honesty between us. Rannoch sits himself down in front of me, smiling and taking an idle sip. I follow his suit, although certain that drinking before noon would be frowned upon back where I come from. The wolf slides his paw towards me, his claws gently scraping the wooden table. He tilts it to the side, revealing another freshly picked dandelion. Well, as a keepsake, while I'm gone, he explains. I smile softly, taking the flower in my hands. Well, if you keep it in fresh water, it should last a week. I nod. This will be a useful reminder that I still have a friend, if nothing else. So, did you rest well? More than I could have hoped so. I sigh, barely containing a smile. Good, I'm glad we were able to clear things up. Oh God, yes. I nod eagerly. We just take idle sips from time to time, not saying much and the silence is slowly becoming awkward. I can see he's mulling over something, his uncomfortable expression betraying a rather pervasive thought. What is it? I ask, trying to nudge him. There's one more thing we haven't discussed, but I couldn't find the right time. Oh, the right words. I smiled at him teasingly. I'd say you've done great strides simply saying what's on your mind. Yes, but this is slightly awkward. More awkward than the heart-to-heart -heart we just had. He nods reluctantly, and I must admit he has piqued my curiosity. Eventually he simply sighs and stands up, approaching me with a hesitant gaze. Uh, threatens to undo all that we managed to fix, so... Oh. Please, keep an open mind about it. He pulls out a leather strap from behind his back and I look at it confused. It has a metal buckle on it, resembling a very short belt. What's this? You have to have it on the next time you leave the house. He says with a slightly averse tone, passing me the item, and I immediately realise what it actually is. I have to wear a collar! I exclaim, choking on my drink. Uh, yeah... OK, what's going on? Rannoch's ears pull back and I can see his grimace deepen. Remember when I told you you released into my custody? I just nod, narrowing my eyes. You said I'm your ward? Well, uh, yes. But it also means you're my attendant now. What? I snap, raising to my feet and squaring off with him. It was one of the conditions of your stay. So that's why Trist is so pissed at me? Oh, Trist doesn't matter. Of course he does. I'm not taking his job. I cut him off with an angered stare. He's right. With a little stunt, he's very much undoing all that we just managed to patch up. It wasn't his to begin with. He responds equally sternly. You were stressed upon me, like everything else in my life. My father wanted to show the others that I can be responsible, because having a ward is a sign of great respect. But I couldn't stand the guy. He's always silently skulking about, giving me funny looks as if judging me. Welcome to the club. I smirk ironically. Either way, I'm not going to be your attendant, whatever the hell that means. I shove the collar back into his paws and march off towards the windowsill. I lean into it, looking at the trees and trying to calm myself down. He's simply killing two birds with one stone. He gets to keep his path and get a more palatable attendant all in one go. What do I get? I get to be paraded around with a collar on my neck like a damned pet. What a joke. I'm so angry. The wolf sighs heavily while I try to give him the benefit of the doubt, but it gets increasingly hard. I can hear Rannock place the collar down on the table and fidget nervously with his cloak. This is not a choice, Sam. The tribe demands it. He mutters quietly as if really made unhappy by a predicament. 
You won't have to do anything. It's just for show. He must have pleaded in me. I'm not a fucking dog. Well, nothing's going to change, I promise. But without it, you cannot go outside. His voice takes on a more desperate tone, but I remain defiant. This is a complete indignation. I'm not wearing it. Well, it's either that or... He cuts off, clearly uncomfortable with what's to follow. Or what? I finally turn around to face him and the wolf winces. I'll have to mark you. Mark me? As in what? Brand me like cattle? Immediately I'm reminded of Trist's Dumbarco tattoo. Was that a mark he speaks of? What? Oh no! He sounds almost offended at this insinuation. You'll just have to wear my scent. Am I not already? I splay up my arms, hinting his must covering me head to toe. That's when Tanner's remark hits me. He doesn't smell like your ward. My eyes widen in terror as I realised how canines mark their territory. Oh God, no! I cover my face, completely mortified by the implication. He flinches in embarrassment at my realisation and looks away. Don't you even say what I think you're about to say. Well, that's why I went with a collar instead. I just stand there, dumbfounded they even suggest pissing on me as if I were a tree. What the hell did I get myself into? He avoids looking in my direction, though I am incredibly infuriated by this nonsensical situation. It's clear it makes him at least in part as uncomfortable as it makes me. I close my eyes, trying to remember there hasn't done anything deliberately malicious towards me. And considering our conversation from just a few hours ago, I should place more faith in his goodwill. He's just playing a part in a bigger play, and my best chance is to follow his lead. I need to control my knee-jerk reactions and show him some trust. I take a deep breath, looking at his worried muzzle and sigh. Well, I've trusted you thus far. I mutter, albeit so begrudgingly, and approach the table. I grab the leather collar and look at it closely. Despite trying to do so with cynicism, I cannot help but admire exquisite craftsmanship. It's quite well made, embroidered edges with soft suede padding on the inner side so as not to bruise the skin. The buckle is also beautifully crafted, with a woven paw embossed in the middle of a full moon. Well, I had it made just for you. A true silver with my emblem on it. This will ensure no one messes with you while I'm gone. And just like that, I'm reminded he's simply looking out for me. Even a bit heavy-handedly. This is ridiculous, utterly ridiculous. I grumble, trying to put the damn thing on. I still want him to know that I'm not enjoying this, even if an odd part of my mind tried to sidetrack me. This is not kinky. Not in this context, at least. Will I have to serve at the feasts, then? I have finally fastening the thing in place. It fits rather snug. The wolf looks back at me and his ears perk up on my reluctant concession. Oh no, that won't be the case. You're an attendant, not a servant. I'm sorry if the distinction is lost on me. We are supposed to keep sure that my personal needs are met, well, that's all. Whatever that means. So, I'll be able to dine with you. Oh yes, attendants are kind of like a professional companion. The silent companion, since they are not supposed to speak. Well, I never have had friendships to foster between a ward and his warden. Depends on what you're looking for in a friend. I mumble. So far, it seems walls value subservience and obedience, both easily achieved in a mute companion. Oh, yes, yes. Granted, your ability to speak our tongue is a perk. He nods with satisfaction, picking up on my train of thought. Well, that just makes us friends with benefits. I erupt in laughter at how apt an assessment this really is. I huddle next to the table, trying to contain my laughing fit. Personal needs, indeed. Sam, would you mind giving me a hand? I make a crude, shaking hand gesture while laughing. This has to be the funniest thing he's said to date. What's so funny? Just the way you phrased it. I wavered him, trying to compose myself. My, what a way to cut the tension. I half wonder if it was intentional, judging by the return of his confident smile. Well, it looks good on you. 
He tries to be teasing and I decide to play along. It'll look even better on you. Well, I'm afraid it wouldn't fit. Yes, your neck is quite fat. Well, it's not fat. He scoffs in feigned annoyance. It's just fluff. He raises his brow proudly and I nod with a smile, picking up my tankard. I wet my lips with amusement, looking love-struck at the wolf again. It's really hard to keep a level head around him. Some time apart will help us temper our emotions. My thoughts go out to the funny bunny, whose grudge against me becomes now more understandable. Trish had a place at the table and now thanks to me has to serve it. I mutter idly. Hmm? I'm just trying to understand his annoyance. To your attendant he had a cushy life, which I've taken away from him. That may be, but I never took Trish to the feast. The wolf protested with scoff, his voice almost mocking. He's just a rabbit. And he might just as well have punched me. What did you say? My stunned reaction caused him to reconsider his words and I can see his flirty demeanour changing to panic. Uh, I mean... Like, I'm just a human, right? I interrupt, looking at him with clear disappointment. By the moon, Sam! He finally snaps in annoyance. Are we really going to do this every time we talk? Do what? Vicar, well, I can't stand it. You're just like Verissa, always on my case. I'm not the bad guy here. I'm not saying you are. You're not exactly a Prince Charming either. I'm not a prince. Obviously not. No wonder Trist is seething. Franica was dismissive of the bunny. Seeing me shout with attention must be aggravating. Well, if he bothers you so much, I'll have him dismissed from the tribe. He stifles a growl and makes me slightly worried. I might have had a bad run-in with a rabbit, but I don't want him banished, especially now when we hold each other's secret. What? I can't believe my ears. I thought you were different. Well, I don't understand your issue here. You say he bothers you, so I'm happy to get rid of him. He's not the problem here. You are. A soft knock stops our arguments. We both lock startled gazes with the door. Am I interrupting something? We fall silent, exchanging looks and both taking a deep breath. Oh no. Rannock finally calls out, clearly relieved by this distraction. For oh, once you're my saving grace. Oh, coup de gras. I scoff watching as the wolf walks up to open the door. Rissa enters the cabin bearing a white garment draped over her arms. Your heated argument can be heard all the way from the path. She looks at us with annoyance. At this rate, Tano and Trist are the least of our concerns. If your bickering continues, the whole village will learn the human speaks by tomorrow. Oh, don't worry. I still plan to leave. The wolf grumbles and looks at me with a hurt expression. I guess we both allowed our emotions to take the lead. And I'm being judgy again. Good. I think some distance is warranted after being forced into such tight quarters. Indeed. His voice is cold, and I feel sad that we allowed things to spiral this far. Right, both of you get rid of those frowns. She touches Rannoch's chin, softly lifting his muzzle. I didn't come here all the way here to break fast with three volts. One is quite enough. The grey wolf smiles. I also try to muster one. I hope that'll do. She ruffles the cloth in her arm. That's all I've been able to scrounge up on such a short notice. Scrounge up. This is quite exquisite. The wolf exhales, running his paws through the delicate fabric. I look with curiosity, seeing how the sun reflects and glimmers on the cloth surface as Verissa sprawls it over the table. In all fairness, I'm glad to be finally rid of it. Rid of it? Why haven't you worn it? Oh, don't you start as well. She smacks her lips in annoyance, looking towards me. She immediately locks onto the collar and smiles. I see you got him to wear it. Uh, good. You knew about this? I sound almost sound accusatory. Of course. To be fair, you not wearing it yesterday wasn't lost on the gathered. You mean they could immediately assume I'm part of the livestock? If you choose to see it that way. She shrugs. Now, up on a chair. The female points as she drags one into the middle of the room. 
I nod reluctantly and jump on, trying to steady myself. For it surpasses me the garment, I'm immediately surprised how soft it is to the touch. I put that on. Um, it's a dress. I frown, finally seeing how it unfurls all the way down to my ankles. My, my, getting sharper with every passing day. That's not exactly what I had in mind. I throw an uncomfortable gaze to Ranok. First the collar, now this. What did you have in mind? The wolf asks impatiently, which makes me realise I might have sounded a little ungrateful. In all honesty, I don't know what I expected. A pair of jeans and a t-shirt, perhaps? Yeah, good luck explaining that. Hmm. Well, I thought so. Ranok scoffs teasingly and I simply pull the dress over my head. I watch it drop freely, covering my body nicely. It feels so strange to be dressed like this. Right, because you're so short I'll have to fold up the bottom. The female wastes no time, pulling and tugging at different parts of the fabric, readjusting it to a new proposed height. Should it go below or above the knees? She looks up to me, but I'm not exactly sure. A Ranok? He throws to the wolf, requesting a second opinion with a playful tone. Why are you asking me that? I don't care. I couldn't help but chuckle at how flustered he got. When her gaze draws back into me, I share his awkwardness. I... I don't know. Well, if you don't want to look like a dress, I'd say above. Then it can pass off as a tunic. Um... I nod with a little conviction in my voice. Relax, no one will even bat an eye. Besides, you've got good knees. Why cover them? She winks and I blush slightly, especially since I notice that the sleeves are cut open, with just two golden pins holding them together. Not to mention how deep the neckline is. What about the top? Isn't it a bit too revealing? I'm not a damn seamstress. I'm going to shorten the base, but that's about all I can do. Can we at least get rid of this? I ruffle a long piece of blue cloth straight around my shoulders. It's sewn in the attire. Why would you want it gone anyway? You have no fur and the dress itself won't keep you any warmer. How's this flimsy dangling strip of cloth going to change that? I put on the bit that cascades down the right side of my back. It's a shawl. Dublin is a cloak if you throw it over your shoulder. It makes me look rather effeminate. I mumble uncomfortably, causing her to laugh. Oh, the horror! She gives a taunting gaze to Ralak, who has been quite smitten with my appearance up to this point. Why are you looking at me? The female shakes her head and returns to regard me, putting two needles into a muzzle. Instead of complaining, you should be happy you don't have to parade yourself naked any more. Now you'll be clad in pure Targaryen silk and Commission cotton. Commission, as in Egypt. They both blink and Rissa looks at Ranok in confusion. Where he's been doing that a lot, throwing random words around. Hmm. She mumbles, looking back at me with a risen brow while struggling to pull up the dress. Commission as in Kemet. I assume it's far away. You assume well. She nods through a smile, placing the needles into the fabric to secure the new baseline. It's on the other side of the globe, so this year, my friend, is a royal gift. She stands up, admiring her handiwork. Not too shabby. She nods in satisfaction and pulls out of her bag a glistening golden belt. Here, put it on. I reluctantly pick it up from her paws. It looks awfully expensive, with each segment connected to the other on a tiny hinge, a large blue gemstone set into the buckle. I drag it across my waist, pulling the dress closer to my figure. Once a click announces the belt is secure, I brush my hands across the fabric to straighten it out. My, my, now you look the part. You mean the part of a noble, right? I mumble awkwardly, causing the wolves to laugh. Okay, give us a turn. She claps her hands in excitement, almost like what your best girlfriend would do seeing you in her borrowed dress. How does it feel? Oddly enough, it fits me perfectly. I smile. The garb is quite comfortable and airy. Not to mention the silk just caresses my skin in an extremely sensual way. You've got a figure for it. Isn't that right, Ranok? Ugh, don't be ridiculous. Mm Mm-hmm. Ridiculous, am I? She draws my attention to the wolf's idle tail flicks and I cannot contain a laugh. 
Well, just give it a rest. How much do I owe you? It was the gift, so I pass it forward. The female shrugs dismissively. I try to get down from my chair, assuming my posing is now done, but Ranok approaches me to lend his paw. A gift? From whom? He asks, his attention fixed on the she-wolf, means as notice my blush at his gentlemanly gesture. Full. She exhales heavily, now drawing my attention as well. He wasted all his money on it during his first visit to Strandbard. He was sixteen, I think. It was meant as part of his courtship. Oh, that's kind of sweet. Hmm. She winces uncomfortably, not really sharing my sentiment. Oh, shit, he's not going to like this. In that case, he can wear it himself, because I assure the moonrise won't. Why ever not? Do I look like a female that prances around in silk dresses? She asks mockingly, and I wince to a smile. No. Either way, I only kept it out of respect for his hard work. It's nice to see something good coming out of it. She ruffles my hair as a loud knocking resonates through the door. And speak of the devil. Damn my luck. Seems the perfect time for my egress was a few moments ago. I don't suppose we could pretend we're not in... We're supposed to eat together. Rannoch frowns. That was before I decided to get rid of this dress. You think it's going to be that bad? It's going to be a shit show. I had hoped we could present Sam in the dress out in the open where Vulcan make a scene. A fait accompli. I nod, trying to ease the tension. Yes. She stutters, looking at me in confusion. Whatever that means. Another, this time more impatient, knock shakes the door. Rannock, I know you're in there. Verissa extends a paw towards the grey wolf, halting from answering. I watch as she walks past me, headed to the bedroom. Sam, be a darling, grab me some moonshine. I need more than ale to get through this spectacle. I nod and rush to the cupboard while Rannock looks to her expectantly by the door. When she has the bottle in her paw, she recedes deeper into the adjacent room, moving completely out of sight. That's when Rannoch finally lets fall in, while I situate myself beside the hearth. The black wolf marches in impatiently, bearing a linen parcel in his paws. Finally, what took you so long? Right, I have what you asked for. There's some jerky, smoked sausage and cheese. He pauses, placing the bundle down, while his blood red irises centre on me. I can see them immediately shrink as he narrows his brows in anger. Well, what are you doing in that? Take it off! His growl thunders across the kitchen and I wince. Verissa gave it. I stumble back as he rushes towards me with paws extended in a frightening fashion, fingers feathered out with claws ready to sink into my flesh. Take it off! Now! I slump into the wall, running out of the room to retreat into. The wolf slams his paws on either side of my sides, causing the cottage to shake as he effectively corners me. His snarling muzzle lowers to my face and I begin to shiver, noticing his every muscle tensed up in anticipation. Yes. I nod, my voice slightly crackling as my prey mentality kicks in at the sight of his jagged fangs so close to my throat. I can see his nostrils expand with each agitated huff of air, and I close my eyes, almost as if wishing him away. Oh. Rannoch finally steps in, trying to push him away as I struggle to get the dress off. When I grab the rim, I accidentally prick myself on one of the needles and jump up. Ah! I said take it off, also help me! He interrupts, hearing Rannoch's old growl at his threat. This redirects Wolf's attention to the other wolves. He throws him an angered gaze. I'm taking it back to her. He's not taking it off and I'm not taking it back. The bedroom door opens and Marissa walks in with a clear annoyance on her muzzle. <laughs> She bangs the clay bottle on the table and squares off with the black male, almost looking ready for a fight. At first, Wolf stumbles slightly, shocked that she's actually present, only to huff in annoyance and regard me in the same anger as before. I said, take it off! Her finger points me commandingly. Don't you dare! I swallow and simply stay still. I spend my days in a den of vigil, tending to the sick and wounded. I cauterize cuts and mend open fractures, most of the time drenched in someone's blood. I don't have a need for a silk dress. She stands defiantly, looking at the male with disdain I haven't yet seen from her. 
I don't care what you do. You can make it into a floor rag if you wish. That thing is not wearing. <laughs> Enough. The female growls, slamming her fist into the table, causing the tankers and the bottle to dance. Although very much feral, her growl is still surprisingly melodic. For crying out loud, you're not your beaters to be ordered around full. So hold your tongue. My eyes are wide open as I never heard a snarl so viciously before. Uh, you both lost your fucking minds. Treating that thing like it's a person, or downright perverse. You yourself treated him with respect to the feast. Rannock tightens his fist, slowly losing his own patience. Fool finally pulls away from me, throwing his massive paws around in annoyance. Well, that's because someone's causing that little bitch to weep for Mobby's tit. Since neither of you are going to keep him passive, I'd have to step in to avoid his all getting banished. Are you quite finished, or shall I come back later once your temper tantrum is wore off? She finally subdues a growl, looking at him with clearly waning patience. I never wore it, nor would I ever. It's a good thing it has some use now. You're even giving away the belt? It's a sapphire set in pure gold. He spits out. He has to tie up his waist somehow. A piece of rope would suffice. Fool, don't be ridiculous. This is pure silk. Yes, your silk. Well, I'll pay you back for this. Rannock tries to place a paw on his friend's shoulder, but Vol brushes it off. You're insane. This is worth a royal ransom. Well, it doesn't matter. You'll squander such fortune on a fucking pig in a dress? Now it's Rannock who snarls, struggling not to bear his fangs at his friend. Well, I'd gladly pay any money to make a friend happy and comfortable, wouldn't you? That question causes Vol to pause, his wild red eyes darting between each of us. That thing's a friend now. Yes, he is. Another subdued growl resonated deep in Rannock's chest. It's clearly slowly losing patience. Full huffs like a locomotive, making my heart race, and I'm convinced they're going to fight once again. But eventually, he simply sighs through a soft growl. Ugh, I don't want your fucking money. It was a gift for her. He weighs his paw between me and Varissa. If she wants to throw it away in a moon damn pig. Full, that is enough. You're hurting him. Well, I haven't touched that little wimp. He snarls at a reprimand, seemingly set off once again. You're the one cradling it with Rannoch like a pair of den mothers. Although expecting another spat to erupt, she simply looks at him dumbfounded, own sigh in resignation and shake her head. Unbelievable. She mutters, approaching the doors. Why do I think you can ever change? You are a damned animal for to lash out on him like that. Well, I haven't laid a single claw on him. Sometimes words cut, ju words cut just as deep, if not deeper. Wait, where are you going? Anywhere where I don't have to look at his snarling muzzle. She opens the doors while Rannock points to the half undone dress. What the? Oh, don't worry, I'll come back to finish it later, once he's not around. She nods towards the black male. What about the breakfast? Enjoy. I've lost my appetite. As she closes the doors behind her, an awkward silence falls over the room. I just stand there, huddled to my corner, really afraid to move while Rannock gives Vull a hurtful and patronising gaze. What? What did I do? Oh, good job, brother. As always, you know how to push everyone away. I turn to look directly at the black wolf, and notice Rannock walk past him towards the doors. He opens them and looks sternly at his friend. You're kicking me out? I want to eat our meal in peace. I need to think. You kind of fucked my plan a little. Rannock huffs in annoyance. Your plan? Well, I was going to ask for Rissa to take care of Sam while I'm away. Wolves' red irises drill into me and I divert my gaze. I feel like a kid who just witnessed a massive fight between his parents. I really don't know what to do. Well, let me take care of it. What? Rannock scoffs, resembling my own surprise in closing the doors. Well, I can look after the piglet. Well, after the stunt you just pulled? You must be joking. I didn't hurt him, nor would I. Well, I'd much rather have Arissa do it. Yes, yeah, so would I, actually. 
and just like that I remembered her earlier offer. Verissa said I could move in with her. I muttered, my voice still faint and low. Oh, it's not that simple. The grey wolf frowns. I'm glad she offered to accommodate you, but I'm sure she meant it as a last resort. Why? Well, you can't just move in with someone else. You are my ward. Rana looks at me apologetically. The only way to change accommodation would be if he dismissed yours, his father would transfer you to another wolf. Well, if one would leave a blemish on you, the latter would leave a blemish on me. Neither an optimal outcome in our current situation. A blemish? Our dismissed wars is proven inadequate, which very much affects the standing. While our wolves had their wars taken away from them, is proven incapable and irresponsible. Another reason why Trist is so pissed, then. He was dismissed with a valid reason, now has to live with the consequences, whatever they are. You'll have to deal with some alone time, kid. Well, you still need someone around. Ranok insists, to which Vol just shrugs. Well, I'll look on him from time to time. Well, he's more than looking in on Vol. Sam is in a fragile state. Ha! Huh, supposed to what? His sturdy one? The Black Wolf scoffs mockingly. See, this is exactly why I know it's a bad idea. Oh, for fuck's sake, Ranok. Since that human showed up, you can't even handle the damn tease. Because this isn't a joke. He states sternly, his eyes betraying he's no longer entertaining his friend's provocations. Sam is not to be dicked around. He suffered immense trauma, goes through moon knows what levels of stress while being cooped up in here on top of the amnesia he has to contend with. Being left alone with his thoughts is the last thing he needs. What's required here is a companion, not a bully. The grey wolf huffs in annoyance. Vol just stands there, thinking for a moment while his gaze darts between me and Rannoch. Eventually he sighs heavily. Ugh, very well. I'll take him under my wing. He won't be left alone for a moment. What? What? Rannoch seems completely shocked by the suggestion, while well, I'm trying to figure out what it actually means. You would really do that? Yes, really. He responds mockingly. I want to prove the wrist I'm not a dumb brute. So that's what it's about. The wolf looks to full with disappointment. Oh, I knew it. You don't give two shits about. Exactly, I don't. Will interrupts him through a soft growl. A human is your obsession, not mine. All I care about is you and her, so you can trust me when I say I won't fuck it up. Sorry if I find that hard to believe at the moment. You nearly tackled him over a damn dress. I gave it to her. This time his growl is not as subtle. I can see Vol's fur bristle and barely contain anger. All those years she never wore it. Not once. Seen her throwing it away, it's almost as if she spat in my muzzle. How would you feel if Cora treated you like this? I... Uh, I... The wolf seems to be caught off guard by the questions if it came out of nowhere. Who's Cora, anyway? I'm so confused, especially seeing Rannock completely stumped. You wouldn't know, would you? You always get what you want. Every female and defective male this side of tin and want a piece of the dream wolf. Full scoffs mockingly, looking at Rannock's growing discomfort. Um, um... See? Considering the circumstances, I think I kept my composure well enough. Besides, I made a promise. He reiterates, tugging at his moonstone. Or does that really mean fuck all to you and you think I would maul him just because I got slightly annoyed? Of course not. I really believe Verissa is better suited for this. Verissa has enough shit to deal with without you smearing yours all over her. Paul huffs him missively, walking towards the table and taking a seat. She needs to keep her distance from this whole mess, especially now with the elders agitated as it is. I don't like this. Rannock mutters and also pulls up a chair, bidding me to do the same. I guess the emotions simmer down to the point where I don't need to act like a deer staring into the headlights. Getting some work done will be good for him. Will nod towards me as I take my seat. He'll learn a skill and starts chipping away at his... No. The grey wolf cuts off, giving him a knowing gaze. Not now. I blink, not keen on being left out. 
chipping away at my what. Well, it doesn't matter. Rana tries to dismiss me, causing Vol to raise his brow. He's talking out of his ass. I'm talking out of my... Vol sneers, narrowing his eyes. You didn't even tell him, did you? Wow, and I'm the asshole? Vol. The grey wolf sounds almost pleading. The black male seems to have none of it. What are you doing, you idiot? He's not a toy, nor your pet to kill time with. Tell him the fucking truth, he deserves to hear it. What truth? I finally pitch in, stared them with growing annoyance. Vol just gives a look to Ranok who winters uncomfortably. As the silence protracts, I just gawk at him until he sighs. Uh, I want you to wait for a better moment. A better moment? He means he hoped he could weasel out of the deal. The black wolf explains mockingly, seeing Ranok's hesitation. Well, it ain't gonna happen. Not the elders, not even his father would ever forgo your obligations. That's just not how things work. He gives Ranok a patronising gaze. My obligations? Again the wolf sighs heavily, clearly uncomfortable with the conversation. Or any other kin who stays with us incurs a debt. I thought you don't allow other kin into the forest. We don't. Full nods. But there are those who are born in Tiernan. The Sylvan folk, I conclude. Oh yes. We allow them to live in our territory and in turn they have to provide tribute. He explains casually, looking over a mug of ale. A tribute? A coin, raw materials, but usually it's foodstuffs. Well, as you could see, we don't grow much here. At first I try to think of it as taxes. The more I think about it, the more I realise it's much, much worse than that. I feel slightly uncomfortable with the idea of those wolves living off what pretty much amounts to an extortion. When the Sylvan folk cannot pay their tribute, they have to provide us with wards as a sort of retainer. Hostages, I state bluntly. This conversation has taken quite a turn. Oh, your word, not mine. I don't even know how to respond to that. You have both been overdramatic. Full scoffs at us. They simply have to repay the debt their people incurred by not fulfilling the tributary obligations. You mean all those bunnies here are, are indentured servants? Well, it's a bit of a crude way of putting it. What other way would you put it? I snap, causing Ranok to wince. Well, it's better than it sounds. How is it better? Well, at least one step above slavery better, I suppose. The black wolf rolls his eyes down in his mug of ale. So what, you own me? Well, more like you owe the tribe for saving your life. Well, I'm just to make sure you work it off. I didn't ask for any of this. You still live with us. You have been sheltered and fed. Oh, my God. I slap my forehead in annoyance. How did I not see this coming? Well, in your defence, Ranuk is a professional meddler. He loves dancing around the truth. Not helpful. Ranuk throws him a stern gaze. Will seems to be enjoying this little spat. I'm not in the mood for teasing. Well, I think it is. I mean, you did tell him you want to take him back home. How are you going to do that if you won't start pulling his share? I listen carefully, watching their respective expressions. What do you mean? I ask even though I fear I know the answer. But his memory hasn't even come back yet. The grey wolf protests. Even if with this very moment he wouldn't be able to allow to leave, not until he pays off his due. My due? I was dying. I almost shout out, barely containing my growing frustration. It's like the US Health Service. They'll bleed you dry while trying to save you. We're a highly meritocratic society. Nothing is handed out here. I'd hoped we'd avoid this conversation altogether if you realised it on your own. Oh, sorry, I didn't realise earlier than being enslaved. How silly of me. I roll my eyes in disbelief he'd pin this on me. Well, that's not what I meant. Well, I just wanted to give it time. It looks angry to Vol. But someone had to push it. Don't look at me, I saw the collar. Better to rip the bandage off. Vol shrugs and a short moment of silence falls over the room. 
and buried in my thoughts, unable to believe how duped I was by this whole setup. As angry as I want to be, I have to admit there are a lot of signs all pointing in this direction. But I just had faith that my worst predictions aren't true. You okay? I would say I'm livid, but I'm actually too stunned for that. I mutter not even regarding him. As the silence continues, I notice Rannock's impatience grow. Then she just snaps and bangs his paws on the table. <coughs> Can you just go? He throws Vol an angry stare. You keep making everything worse. Worse? You are such a fu- you are such fucking hypocrites. The black male scoffs to a sneer. You both shit on me for being blunt, while you two are simple lying cunts. What are you on about? My eyes dart between their growling muzzles. Do you think Marissa gives a flying fuck about his human whelp? He asks mockingly. She only entertains his charades. If she pulls it off, she'll secure a position of Charwin forever after. And don't get me started on you, you self-righteous asshole. All you really need this human force to prove to everyone what a perfect little chief you would make. How the ancestors themselves anointed you and your master plan. Change. Full huffs rolling his eyes. You want no change for hit you on your muzzle. Oh. Ronak's expression twists into a snarl as the entire body tenses. Please, at least I have the decency to not manipulate that gullible idiot like you do. My heart begins to race, but it's not fear this time. This time it's annoyance that yet again I'm being caught between their stupid spats. As much as Will makes some valid points, he's the last one to speak. You did manipulate me. I shout out at him, causing them both to gaze at me in surprise. At the feast, I thought... I tried to be calm, my emotions whirled in the wrong direction and my eyes gloss. I thought you liked me. I thought we were becoming friends. Rannock's softened expression proves that my hurt is clearly painted over my face, but Vol is not receptive to it. Instead, he gives me a nasty look, one of those he hasn't given me since the day he stabbed me. Friends, what do you think this is, a dent tail? I barely know you, kid. All I did was keep you from fucking this over with your spiralling emotions. Seriously, are you that desperate for attention and approval? He sneers and I've had enough. <laughs> I stand up and bang the table, looking at him angrily through tears. In case you forgot, I don't have my fucking memory. No family or friends to speak of. I don't have anyone. It's just me and nothing else. So yes, forgive me if I seek friends wherever I can. I stand there with my rattled breath, half expecting Vol to lash out again, met with something unexpected, a stunned expression. Vol sits still, trying hardest look and moved. It's quite evident my little rant made him quite uncomfortable. Huh, who's a fucking hypocrite now? Rannock looks to him with begrudging satisfaction. I have half a mind to tell him off, but I'm done with this shit show. I just slump back into my seat, crossed my arms and looking towards the window. Bacon, eggs and toast. A wolf lover. I'm such a moron, thinking I'm in some fairy tale B&B. I scoff at the dumb analogy. Even the B&B I have to pay the bill at the end. Uh, I need a drink. Wolf finally breaks the silence, sinking deeper into his seat and causing the chair to squeak. Rannock pushes a tanker towards his friend, not saying anything, but Wolf brushes it aside. Ah, that weak piss. I need something strong of this headache. The black wolf scoffs and reaches the clay bottle. Again he removes the cork with a satisfying pop and takes a long deep series of gulps, most likely down in half of the contents in one go. He then sits back heavily, rubbing his muzzle and placing the bottle on the table. A piglet has to stay here. You know I'm right. He mutters looking at Rannock with a serious expression. The grey wolf sits there troubled, then she turns to face me with a risen brow as if to gauge my opinion. Don't look at me. You own me, remember? I respond snarkily. I don't have a choice in the matter. Oh, Sam. The wolf mutters apologetically. Don't Sam me. Not only do I have to wear a collar, but I also have to do forced labour. Well, those are just details. Pretty fucking important details, you ask me. Which you didn't. I mean, why would you? People don't ask their furniture for an opinion. Yeah. Vol slides a bottle towards me and I simply sigh. Fuck it, I'm so angry at this point I might as well just take a deep swig. 
Well, that's why I made you my attendant. This way I can say you're doing your job while you don't have to lift a finger. Well, Triss never really had to do any work around here. And you think nobody noticed? Will scoffs, reaching back the bottle. Look how much good that did him. His dead is nowhere near paid. Again, could you just... Oh, yes, sorry. Wouldn't want to upset the furniture. He winks at me and I cannot help but smile at the remark. I take a deep breath and sigh heavily. This is fucking ridiculous. I woke up in his damned house, got choked to near death by a massive wolf, then stabbed by said wolf, only to learn that I'm now a slave. A ward. A slave. I insist, giving him a stare that should leave no doubt I'm not going to play semantics. A slave who now owes the tribe for not being murdered on sight. And all of this within a week. A hell of a week. Will raises the bottle to take a long swig and a faint toast. What's next? Well, there's always the possibility he'll get found out and he'll be imprisoned and hanged. Perfect. I shake my head. Oh, give me that. Rannoch snaps, pulling the bottle from Vol's paws and down in the thirsty gulp. Anyway, I'll take care of Piglet. If he's with me, Tanner will stay the fuck away. Yeah, he's one of my worries. I can handle my... Si I cut off, seeing Vol give me a rather mocking gaze, obviously hinting at my conduct at the feast. I know I messed up, but I have a better bearing now. Now they both give me doubtful looks. Look, a Drannock not... The grey wolf's eyes widen in fear, and I realise I cannot actually explain our little jealousy game. Aranok not what? Well, you know, I mumble, trying to back paddle. You said it yourself, he can act like a fool. Yeah, him ditching you alone with Tanner to follow some tits was a classic move. Well, I didn't ditch him to... Now I flash my eyes at Aranok so that he plays along. Ugh, it wasn't like that. No? It would have been harder to bounce her up and down with Piglet at your side. She threw herself on me. Yes, and you put up a valiant fight. I try hard not to be snoopy, but I cannot help it. The she-wolf made me incredibly jealous, more so than I have a right to be. Still, I have to know. Is that a common occurrence? Well, is Rannock? Oh, yes. Well, almost sounds annoyed. Every female in this village just swoons over the fucker. Honestly, I don't know what they see in him. I do. I've been sworn it over him since day one. It's that smile. This damn cocky smile. I hope he doesn't abuse this. Again, perhaps too sneaky jab, but I want to know if all this attention doesn't get to his head. Ha! If half the tribe had what he has, there'd be pups running all around the place. I close my eyes and sigh discreetly. Good boy. Could we change the subject? This is getting slightly awkward. The wolf looks away, clearly unsettled by a little exchange. Sure. Full shrugs. How about you explain to me why the fuck you're leaving all of a sudden? Your father exempted you from any task that would leave the piglet unattended. You mean without someone to attend to? He flashes his brows at me in amusement, causing Rannock to sigh. Well, someone has to find out what happened with Gara and Dalron. It's been way too long. Tanner could have taken care of that and we'd get him out of the village. Which is why he would never volunteer for this. My father doesn't see any urgency to actually order a search party. Hmm. Full muse is shaking the bottle to gauge the remaining levels of booze. He takes a sip and then pushes the bottle towards me. I should have asked me then. I'd have gone. We are on a week's rest. What sort of leader would force a friend to forego his leave? I tilt my head in agreement as I take the final gulp of the moonshine. Damn, Vol needs to demolish it on his own. Well, I smell bullshit. What was its urgency and concern a day ago? You're not telling me something. He drills his gaze into each of us, starting it back and forth expectantly. I really hope he doesn't suspect anything. Fuck, I don't think it would be a good idea to unpack that little morsel right now. Rannock shares my troubled expression. I wonder if he has a plan to dodge his bullet. You're right. He nods awkwardly. There is another reason. I got blinded by the human. I got so focused on the edge of him being my path that I neglected what truly matters, my duty. So I try to fix that. I looked at him in disbelief. 
I might know this wolf just seven days, but even I'm not dumb to buy this pathetic excuse. Which I'm glad to hear you finally come to your senses. I know it's horseshit. I say it's far more like you just need some time apart. My heart skips a beat and my eyes widen in shock. Ronak's also extremely troubled and I begin to wonder if we've just been found out. What, you think I'm stupid? He looks to me with a smirk and I swallow heavily. I would hope you'd be at least a little bit, yes. Well, the amount of wool he pulled over your head, I bet you two are bickering like two old mates. Wool nods to Ronak, laughing it off. That's right, you have been prime example. He stretches his arms behind his back in satisfaction. I barely contain a sigh. Yeah, I am quite annoyed, not going to lie. I smile awkwardly. See, at least the piglet's been honest. Okay, you got us. Ranok chuckles. We started to get on each other's nerves a little bit. Ha, I knew it. <laughs> Full bangs the table in content. That part of yours turned out to be a thornbush trail, eh? He elbows Ranok mockingly and we just exchange relief gazes. Right, we better get going. Your father hates it when we're late for the meetings. A meeting? Yes, before any pack leave, the elders come to give us their guidance. Full rolls his eyes in annoyance, immediately pick up on his train of thought. Nothing like a bunch of old people telling you how to do a thing completely unrelated to their actual circumstance. I simply shrug and stand up. No, you cannot come. But no piggies allowed. I throw Ronak a worried gaze. I won't let him leave without a proper goodbye. The old grey wolf nods to me, immediately understanding my distress. Uh, could you go ahead? I'll catch up to you. Huh? Will raises his brow in slight suspicion, but Ranok doesn't seem to care. Well, I just want a moment alone with him. Why? Ranok just stands there looking at his friend telling me. I'm not sure if he doesn't respond so he doesn't want to tell him. Or can't tell him the truth, but eventually Vol takes the hint. Uh, you're going to get sappy here then, yes. I better leave. Well, it's called positive reinforcement. It's called being a moon damn den, mother. The black male scoffs and throws me a rather unsettling gaze. By the time you're back, I'll toughen up that little wimp. Please, don't. Ranok mutters, watching Vol opening the door. Yeah, I'd rather he didn't either. So far, Vol's method ended with me roughed up rather than toughened up. I'll come and look in on you later. The black wolf scoffs and closes the door behind him. Silence falls over the rooms we just stand there rather uncertain what to do or say. Ronk didn't even turn to face me, his gaze still locked on the door. It almost seems as if he's reconsidering this whole idea to leave. Suppose he came out with it when the emotions were high and now regrets it without means to back out. That perhaps would have been the case with me, but no. When he finally sighs and turns to face me, I see his typical confident smile. Despite acting like a pup at times, he does have his life figured out. So, I guess this is goodbye. Oh, goodbye? He blinks for a moment, but quickly smiles again. More like, see you later. You know what I mean. I mumble, fiddling with the edge of my shawl. Though I agree with the whole idea on paper, it only now dawns on me I actually won't see him for a few days. You won't come back! No, I'm not even entertaining that idea. You're okay. He tilts his head into my field of vision. I... I cut off, not really sure if it's even fair to say it. I think we should both follow the newly established policy of honesty between us. I'll miss you. I try to hold back my emotions. What's wrong with me? Well, despite learning you're now part of the furniture. He raises his brow teasingly and I chuckle. Yes, despite that. I'll miss you loads, as silly as it sounds. I rub away at a stray tear. He can annoy me so much at times. For all of it is circumstance. I slowly begin to see that. He's struggling to find his bearer in this messed up situation as much as I am. Well, I'll miss you too. He snickers, ruffling my hair in teasing fashion. Well, that only gives more reason to come back as fast as possible. Yeah. I try to smile back. Well, don't worry. I'm sure Vol will be a handful. I'm afraid you'll have to look out for him as much as he will be looking out for you. 
without a doubt. I scoff through a laugh. I'm really proud they managed to keep the waterworks down. Well, just be careful, I'm gone, okay? Hmm. I nod, picking up the dandelion and booping him on the nose with it. This time I won't lose it. Well, I'll hold you to it. The wolf smiles as I rush to grab a spare cup. I fill it with water from the jug, intent on placing the flour in it. Well, if you crush the end, you'll absorb water better. Oh? Electron with confusion is, extends its paw towards me. Ah, oh, here. I pass him the dandelion and he places it back onto the table. He unsheathes his smaller sword, using its pummel to crush the stem's edge. Causes it to split into many tiny fibres and I smile with amazement. There's so much to teach me. He places the flower into the cup which I still hold in my hands. Well, it should last a week without a problem. I smile, bring down the cup onto the table and look at him with slight embarrassment. Is it okay if I hug you before you leave? Well, I won't have it any other way. The wolf smiles, his tail swinging from side to side in obvious joy. Before I even open my arms, his paw swoops behind me and he pulls me deep into his chest. My head sinks into his neck fluff and I take deep inhales of his scent, almost as if wanting to imprint it into my memory. His embrace is equally as desperate, it's the first time he uses actual strength to keep me close. I can feel his muzzle and cheeks rub against the top of my head as the wolf nuzzles into my hair. I feel safe, warm and cherished in his arms. But like any good thing, this hug comes to a faster end than I'd like it to as Ranok pulls away from me. He looks troubled, evidently struggling to maintain his mask. You'll be fine. I try to sound encouraging and he looks at me with surprise. Me? He laughs. You always worry about the others, don't you? Well, I'll be fine as long as you promise you'll stay vigilant. I will. I nod with a confident smile. I'll prove to you that I don't need to be a babysitter. Good, I'm looking forward to it. The wolf approaches the doors and pulls the handle. The light of the outside world floods the kitchen as he opens them ajar. I know you'll make me proud. I nod and simply watch as he steps out, the light slowly recedes as he shuts the door behind him. I'm alone once again. The unsettling feeling slowly creeps to my stomach, but I won't let myself be tortured. With the free time on my hands, I'm going to look through the books again. But first, I need some breakfast. I unfold the parcel, reveal a selection of meats and cheeses, and fetch myself a fresh bun. It's sad that a joint breakfast didn't come to pass, but it's more the reason to not allow this food to go to waste. I simply dig in, enjoying my meal in peace and quiet. With everyone gone, the day drags on mercilessly. I spend a few hours just sitting there mulling over everything that happened. The feasts, the dance, the kiss. So much as I want to agree this space will be good for us, I can't help but crave to just bury myself in my wolf. My wolf. God, I am so clingy. I laugh it off, shaking my head. Only now I notice I'm filling with my collar. The damn thing. I try to hate it, but it also feels oddly satisfying, as if Ranok claimed me as his own. I mean, it is the case to a degree. Perhaps not exactly in the fashion of me calling him mine, but similar possessiveness. It's flattering, I guess, in a messed up sort of way. Which is fitting to my current circumstance. The morning stretches into an afternoon, I think about means of killing some time. I remember the chief asking me if I came from Freyfall. There was a book around you mentioning that name. I stumbled upon it when I was cleaning. I decided to retrieve it, as learning what it actually means to be a human in this world could come in handy. I find the tome in the bedroom lying on the windowsill. Brief history of Freyfall. I place the book on the bed and fetch myself a cup of ale, knowing full well it would be a laboursome read. I sit myself comfortably on the mattress, my back resting against the headboard and simply flip the cover. The opening is a gruelling task to get through, again filled with names and dates that mean very little to me. However, the one thing that sticks out is the namesake herself, Frey. Apparently she was a sorceress of great power back in the Age of Men. From context, I assume humans once ruled over this world, though the book so far doesn't state what exactly caused the situation to change. 
Thray was part of what the book refers to as Pantheon, a group of exceptionally gifted vigils who guided in hum- early humans. It seems this book is part of a series, as it often refers to another title called Twilight of Men, which apparently deals with the breaking of the Pantheons. It seems Frey's clique wasn't the only one overseeing the development of mankind. Different Pantheons looked after their own tribes, often competing with one another. I cannot but feel like all of this is vaguely familiar. Anyway, Frey had her last stand in the lands east of here, where she fell defeated by the Aspects. Whatever that means. Ever since, the area was forever known as Freyfall, to commemorate the valiant defiance of the sorceress and attempt to save mankind from targeted genocide. Thanks to a noble sacrifice, the Aspects were unable to wipe out all of humanity or were forced to retreat into hiding. From the ashes of their once mighty empires, the remaining humans formed what is called successor kingdoms, petty realms which forever after struggled to survive against the tide of the beast folk. I shut the book with confusion. This leaves more questions and gives me answers. I don't think I like to learn I'm extinct species. It just doesn't feel right. Vague familiarity aside, this now reads like a poorly written fiction. However, since I'm here, I cannot help but feel unsettled by this information. Am I really from this world? Am I part of a dying race? The bigger question is, why would the Aspects, whoever they are, want to wipe out humanity to begin with? Sure, we have some issues, but these wolves don't seem to be saints either. If there are some supervising beings looking over this world, I think one verbal and two written ones would be better policy than rather than skipping straight to a global scale genocide. As I'm about to open the book again, I hear knocking the outer door and I assume it's full. It's been a while, so this means Ranok has most likely left already. I open the doors and I'm greeted with Verissa instead. Oh, you're back. You sound almost sound disappointed. She chuckles, pushing, pushing past me. I promised Ranak I'd get the dress done, so here I am. The female points to the chair and unpacks from her pouch a white thread with a shiny needle embedded into the spool. Get up, I need to readjust the height of the Vulman handled you. He hardly touched me. I smile awkwardly as I walk onto the chair. Kind of you to say, but that's beside the point. Rissa picks a few pins and secures them between her lips. She tugs at the fabric, making sure that they're lines properly again. When she's happy with the new edge, she simply fastens the dress bit by bit. I let her work without interruption, until eventually she is done. Right, take it off, but gently. We don't want it to get crooked. I nod and proceed with caution. Once the dress is in her possession, she simply unfolds it in her paws and seats herself comfortably at the table. I watch as she strings the thread through the needle, slowly getting down to sewing. How was the spectacle then? She muses as she pulls the needle through the fabric. Not that bad, actually. I mutter uncomfortably. Hmm. She sounds unconvinced, but I really don't want to add to her misgivings about Vol. True, he might be a bit short-fused, but I'm sure he has his reasons for it. And so far, it seems that scolding for it doesn't yield any desirable results. He's not that bad, just grumpy. Ha! She laughs sarcastically, a paw going up and down with the thread dancing merrily in the air in long waves. That's one way of putting it. Vol's very much a powder keg. A slightest spark can set him off in the most spectacular of ways. I frown, really saddened to hear that. Was he always that way? Oh yes, Vol was pretty much in rage ever since he was a pup. I've gotten quite immune to his tantrums. For your sake, I hope you will too. You won't harm me. I say with utmost confidence. After all, he did swear on the moonstone, and so far I've no reason to doubt him. Maybe, but anxiety caused by his rampage isn't exactly healthy either. I could sense your heart from the other room. He had you in a proper state. She gives me a concerned look, and I have to concede he is stressing me a lot. I honestly wonder how he does it. The female sighs, returning to her task. Huh? Ranok, how he deals with him is beyond me. I'm sure it's because Vol is worth the hassle. I can see a struggle subdue a smile, and she sighs again, this time more amused than resigned. He doesn't make it seem like seems like it at times, doesn't he? But like with any delusions, this one wears off quite fast. Usually by his own choice. 
Her expression returns to a slight scowl and she continues looping the thread to the dress's edge. It's clear that those two have some issues, especially with Vol's now clear infatuation with the female. She leaves no doubt that the feeling is unreciprocated. I wonder if it's just the way it is, or perhaps something is done. He seems very much keen on you. Keen on me? She blinks, giving me a confused look. I know. I'd say he's keen on the idea of me. What's the difference? The lack of trying to understand who I actually am for a start. Ever since he proclaimed his interest in me, it was slowly on the fact that I strike his fancy. Small, slender, curvy, white like the moon. That's all he sees, he sees me as. She scoffs and her voice betrays, betrays a hint of hurt. Seriously, what idiot would dump a fortune to a damn silk dress? Especially on the assumptions of the female, I should wet myself in excitement at the sight of it. She ruffles the garment in my direction. This here, this is an insult, not a gift. I'm not a den wife. I'll never be a polite little mother raising other wolves' pups. If he'd spent at least some of his days to actually get to know me rather than objectify me. She almost stifles a growl, a pause tensing around the fabric. She's taking this very personally. Every wolf is the same. I don't know what I expected. Look at you. Rissa scoffs, waving a paw at me. Wait, why is she bringing me into this? Kaelin, indeed. That's all they see, a tight fit. She cuts off, looking at me in surprise she actually went that far. I just sit there, as petrified by Medusa's gaze. Rissa simply throws her head to the sides and coughs nervously. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to imply anything. All I'm saying, we're more than just our looks. I hastily nod, wish I could just explode into a cloud of dust and disappear. The female returns to her task and simply continues sewing, more determination and movements betraying she wants to be done with it as fast as possible. I share her sentiment. The little rant went sideways quick and put me on a rather uncomfortable spot. I don't hold a grudge. Clearly she's upset by the way Vol treats her. I also think there's a hint of regret if she expected more of the male. Perhaps his feelings towards her aren't as unreciprocated as I initially thought. But what's more important, I think she's suspecting something between me and Rannoch. First the conversation at the Moon Shrine, now this. I appreciate her discretion and apparent supportiveness, but I have to disagree. Perhaps Wool does objectify her a lot, and Rannoch's choice of my nickname seems to now tad unfortunate in the context, but the Grey Wolf is different. If anything, me being a human seems to trouble Rannoch as much as I'm troubled by him being a wolf. Yes, there's a surface level attraction. From my heart to heart, I think it's clear we're both drawn to our personalities. I feel sorry for what she goes through, especially since Vol seems very much capable of more. We just sit there in silence while she finishes her handiwork. When she's done, she bites off the thread to separate it from the needle. Right, I'm not a professional, but this should hold as long as you're not rough with it. She passes me back the garment and I put it on. It falls freely to my knees and I must admit I enjoy my new tunic. Since Ranok isn't here, you're not required at the feast. She states matter-of-factly and I take it as you're not wanted there. Oh, uh, okay. Vol should bring you some food in the evening. A very sudden shift of demeanour betrays she's uncomfortable, most likely feeling she's said too much. Despite wanting company, I decide not to hold her back. This was quite too personal, even of my liking. Stay safe. Marissa utters, collecting her things and rushing towards the doors. She pulls on the handle and cracks them open. The female stops for a moment, looking back to me, almost as if she wanted to say something. Instead, she just sighs and shakes her head. Bye. I mutter, watching as the door closes and I'm alone again. I spend my time between figuring out how to start the fire and deciphering more of that fantastical book. To my own surprise, I managed to get the hearth going after just an hour of tinkering with Rannoch's antiques. I live on what's left from the breakfast and wash it down with some beer while I continue my read. Apparently the lions are one of the main reasons why my kin is such a rare sight. They arrived in Avalon, bent on conquest and establishing their own kingdom, subjugating all the folk living here. Their first target were the humans of Freyfall, whom lions viewed as inferior and fit to live in their new domain. They laid waste to the land, butchering entire towns and villages, finally standing at the very gates of the human capital in these lands. Freyrun was the largest city on the continent, grand and wondrous, a last vestige of the humanity of old. 
The lions had no means of breaching the city with its massive stone walls, so at first they resorted to starving it out. The humans of Freyfall stood firm, resupplying their city through the river. Impatient, the lions decided to terrorise the populace into submission. Each night they had catapulted half-eaten human cadavers into the city, aimed at breaking the spirit of the defenders. The humans stood firm, days, then weeks. In the end, it wasn't their spirit that failed, but their bodies. Sickness and disease overwhelmed the city, and after the early year of siege, Freyrun capitulated. Show sure, others the price of such brave defiance, the lions put the city to the sword and torch. What follows is a detailed account of rape and plunder, with some paragraphs going as far as calling the lions kin-eaters, something which seems to be one of the most monstrous stigmas nether kin can bear. I must admit I'm relieved to learn that cannibalism between the kin is, is frowned upon, but it then settled that lions resort to devouring those they considered lesser. And it would seem humans weren't the only ones on the menu, but the sylvan folk as well. No wonder other kin rebelled. The rebellion itself is a muddled jumble of dates and events which, spanning a century, are easy to confuse. Despite being lost half the time, I finally realised why tigers had brought up so much in my context. After the success of the Tiger Rebellion, Freyfall became a province of the Tiger Realm. Although mainly populated by Tiger folk, humans are still a sizable minority there. It also seems they're very much respected, and according to the book, partake in the governance of Tigeron. I guess a human Targaryen noble isn't such a crazy idea after all. As for the lions, Tigers have banished them, forced the entire prides into exile, leave the continent and never to return. Fit in end of those murdering monsters. If at least half the stuff I re- read is true, then I definitely don't want to meet a lion. I closed the book, trying to digest this information. It all seems so surreal and very much out of place. I don't feel part of this world. Some of the information is familiar, but my head is also filled with jumble that doesn't fit the context. I'm more and more convinced I've somehow stepped through the looking glass. I stay like that for a while, just enjoying the fire and musing. With my mind sated with a lot of new knowledge, both general and personal, I have an easy time keeping my thoughts in check. Hopping between Rannoch's struggles and Rissa's heartaches, I get to avoid the darkness stalking the recesses of my mind. In fact, focusing on their hardships seems almost as effective as the ground in reality as Rannoch himself is. I feel sorry for the male, having given him a lot of unnecessary flack without even considering how hard his day-to-day life really is. I'm also a bit disappointed with Vol. I hope to get some time to check the ground around him. Despite Varissa's words, she does seem to feel something towards the male. It'd be a shame if he ruined his chances by acting like a toxic male. I half suspect he's only doing it because he thinks it's expected of him. Just as I'm slowly dozing off, I hear a knocking that stirs me up again. Speak of the devil. Piglet! I rush to the doors and open them hastily. The wolf walks in, holding a sizable pastry in his hands. Nice. You managed not to burn the place down. Steak and kidney pie. He places it on the table and looks to me uncomfortably. I'm sorry I took this long. They wouldn't let me leave the feast. In fact, I have to head back there, so I can't stay. Oh, it's okay. I'm slightly disappointed, but I must have a brave smile. Don't give me that, kid. If you're of age, you can deal with no with one day on your own. I didn't say anything, but you're about to think it. I chuckle his accusation. Either way, you better get some sleep. I'll be coming to fetch you just before the dawn. Huh? Why? You're coming with me to the butchery. To do some forced labour. I grumble, but he's having none of my snark. Have some company as Rannock prescribed it. I don't have the luxury of fucking around in someone else's house. He scoffs at me and walks back towards the door. Seriously, get rested, because I don't want you bitching over my ears the whole day tomorrow. Okay, okay, I will. I just wave him away and allow the wolf to leave. Once he's gone, I just sit down and take a curious glance at the pie. It's still warm and slightly steamy. I fetch myself one of the forks Rannock borrowed from the villa and dig in. However, seeing how succulent and juicy it is on the inside, I feel rather uncomfortable eating it in my brand new silk dress. I look around and locate a hand towel on the cupboard. I use it as a napkin to safeguard my fancy garment and continue with my food. 
The pie is very hearty with soft stewed meat and onion slices covered in delicious gravy. An excellent way to end a rather dull day, if one discounts a morning kerfuffle. The meat does the trick. It fills my belly and makes me extremely drowsy. I down one glass of water and quickly wash up for I retreat to the bedroom. I take great care while I'm dressing, holding my clothes gently onto the chest. As I slip into the linens, I dart my gaze between the warm fire and the hearth and the cold world outside. I hope Bran looks comfortable. I like to imagine he's camping out there in the woods, looking into a similar flame, hopefully with similar longing. Good luck, Wolf. See you soon. I close my eyes and simply drift away into the memory of his warm embrace. To be continued. There we go. That is it for this update of uh, Far Beyond the World. I hope you enjoyed that. Sorry it's a bit late, but uh, I was actually very busy yesterday evening. I had no time to record. So don't forget you can support this on Patreon. You can uh, follow it on Itch. And uh, Kale has his uh, Discord as well. So you're always welcome to join if you're not already there. It can be quite a bit of fun. So, I've done a lot of talking. I'm going to leave it here. Thanks for watching. Until next time, bye for now.